Featured readers tonight are familiar faces to Fish Trap. They're Mary Emmerich, Cameron Scott, and Fish Trap founder, Rich Wanschneider. I'm super excited about this. For, uh, I'm gonna step back for just a second. Uh, for those who don't know much about Fish Trap Fireside or Fish Trap, uh, we're a literary arts and humanities organization in Wallowa County. That's the Northeast corner of Oregon, homeland of the Nimipu, the Nez Perce people. And our office is in a historic, beautiful home in Enterprise. I'm here right now. And usually the thing is this place is full of people on a fireside night, dozens and dozens of folks catching up, telling stories and coming to hear their friends and neighbors uh, read a little bit about what they're writing and thinking about. Hopefully we'll all be able to gather again here soon. It's gonna be a little while, but uh, for now, we're going to provide Fish Trap Fireside online. And the thing that's cool about that is now people from all over the place, people who've been fans of Fish Trap and part of the Fish Trap community, people who are just learning about it, people who are interested in writing or thinking about maybe stepping up to an open mic someday and reading their work, you can tune in and be a part of this. Welcome to you all. And thanks to Copper Creek, Mercantile here in Joseph for being our October sponsor. Next time you're cruising through Joseph, stop by and say hi to those fine folks. And especially to each and every one of you who've made a donation to Fish Trap this past year. It's been rough and everything that you've done has really made it these things possible. Thanks. So pour yourself a cup of something, sit back and enjoy tonight's program. Let's get this thing started. Our first reader tonight is Mary Emmerich. I'm gonna read her bio. She writes memoir and fiction from a log cabin in the mountains. Her third book, a memoir on kayaking in Alaska will be published in the spring of 2021. Her best ideas come from long distance hiking, such as completing the entire Pacific Crest Trail. Before we got started, she was sharing stories about uh, trying to hit all the named lakes in the Wallawas this summer. Uh, her website with descriptions of her books and blog is located at maryemmerich.com. Hi, Mary. Exciting news about your book. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Thanks, um, and thanks for having me. Um, my book is coming out in April, like you said, and Oregon State University Press is going to be publishing it, so that's very exciting. And uh, right now we're in talking about the cover and the title, and doing some galley proofing. So it's a really interesting part of the process. Well, thanks for being a part of it. Would you read something for us tonight? Sure, I'll read an excerpt from that forthcoming book. And I do wanna say again, thank you for having me and, and thanks to Fishtrap for having this great series. I appreciate it. So I will read a chapter from the book. In the wilderness, I moved through a world of men. Out on the coast, other women were few. Instead, I saw men balancing on decks of salmon trollers, gliding in for the evening anchor, shaggy haired bear hunting guides and their camel clad clients, binoculars poised on deck as they slowly motored past the estuaries. Men walked big in this big world, spitting tobacco and spraying gunfire on remote beaches. Men staffed the weirs and the fish camps that dotted the lonely bays. Men piloted the, the mid-sized cruise ships that hovered in the strait searching for whales. Even the rare kayakers we saw were men. Swaddled in layers of wool and rubber, I began to feel androgynous, poised between the two extremes. This was not unusual. For most of my life, I had slipped through the boundaries of world meant to keep people out, especially women. To survive, I had become fluid, able to pass. I had learned to stay silent when the jokes and whiskey came out. I had learned to keep up when a man set a punishing pace to get to the top of a mountain, determined to drop me. In my last job, my boss told me they had been, been reluctant to hire a woman, but had decided to take a chance. After all, he backpedaled. I'd be working alone in remote country. What woman would want to do that? Unspoken were his thoughts. What woman could do that? I was used to the language of men. They were loud and unfiltered. They said what they meant, even when their words scraped across a raw edge. I had fought fire with men, sleeping in still warm ash on the mountainsides, carrying Pulaski's and shovels and chainsaw gas on forced marches through smoke that stung my eyes. 
I had clear trails with men pushing the crosscut saw back toward my partner as we chewed our way through a fallen giant. There have been times when I thought I could not be happier sharing ham sandwiches and jokes with men in the wilderness. But for paddling, I preferred women. The men I took along cursed the sea when it turned against us. They stumbled through camp before sunrise, oblivious to sleepers intent upon coffee. We worked on their schedule. When they were hungry, we ate. When they were tired, we slept. They brought up reasons why you should deviate, deviate from, not deviate from our chosen plan. Too far, too difficult, too impossible. If we were stranded by weather, they paced the shoreline muttering about lost chances. They always wanted to take charge. The women weren't like that. They picked the easier line around the rock cliffs, sought shelter in the kelp beds without apology. They stood in rubber boots on bare black rocks, finding delight in everything. The translucent shapes of fish in the shallows, elder clad buildings peering out from shore. When the sun came out, we cast off our fleece layers and let our hair fly like flags. We were no longer wives, daughters, mothers. We were released, free, wild. We were safe from dark alleys, unlit parking lots, the shadows of strangers following us, the constant low level fear that dogged all women. This must be how men felt all the time, I thought. Helga and I wove between the islands that dotted Necker Bay. We had paddled together so often that we moved in tandem, our strokes nearly matching. An unexpected sun glinted off the water drops flung from our paddle blades and made the ocean surface sparkle with white light. These islands were the first defense against the sea and they looked it. Beaches punished by winter storms, driftwood piled higher than we were tall far back in the forest. The sea never gave up here constantly pushing forward and falling back in a ceaseless attack. The land itself was restless, whipped by hurricane force winds and gouged by rain-driven landslides. The whole place churned with an energy I could almost feel as we approached a possible takeout. Too much surf, I decided, studying the wave break onto the sandy beach. Helga nodded. As usual, we were in sync with our decisions. We paddled around the island's flank to protected cove. From there, we would walk across to the outer shore. What's on the other side? Helga asked as we carried each boat to higher ground. We reached in the cockpits and pulled out the necessary gear, rifle, bullets, campsite monitoring sheets, camera and trash bags. People camp over there, I said, lifting the rifle to my shoulder. I spilled a handful of extra slugs into my pocket. Besides, did you see that sandy beach? There's supposed to be some kind of a driftwood hut over there too. Let's go check it out. We hiked through a ragged line of forest, the horizontal line of horizon visible on this narrow island. The interior was lumpy as if someone had raked up the land into piles. The distinctive odor of skunk cabbage filled the air and I pointed out where a bear had been digging out the plants. Bears ate it as a laxative after hibernating and we were right on the edge between winter and spring. My feet sunk into deep sand. Somehow this beach existed in the middle of the wilderness, a half circle of gold ringed by evergreens. Sometime in the near past, a bear had wandered down this beach, its tracks a meandering line between tide and forest. But we were alone now. We trudged through the damp sand to the far end of the beach. A small hut stood there. The builders had carefully arranged driftwood silvered with age into a one-room cabin. Someone had painstakingly carved its name on the sill, the elves' hut. It did seem like a place for magic. I prowled the cabin looking for treasure and clues of who stayed here. A note was jammed between the driftwood planks, signed by two men and written to a woman, Audrey Sutherland. It talked about a route they were taking and said they were sorry to have missed her. Audrey Sutherland, I felt an electric jolt of excitement. I'd been following her trail for months. Though people spoke of her, sometimes I thought she wasn't real. We were just a few paddle strokes behind her, it seemed. If she really existed, she was a woman much older than I was, a woman who had been paddling this coast for years, always solo. Nobody knew when she would appear next, but she was seldom seen in towns, showing up only for resupply. I had heard that in earlier years, she swam the coast of Molokai in jeans, her possessions tied in a shower curtain for the sheer sake of exploration. In Alaska, she took a small inflatable kayak, hardly comparable to our high-tech boats. She built small campfires and gathered wild greens for her salads. She seemed to always pack out a bottle of wine too. She seemed to never be afraid, not of big seas or bears. I stood at the elves hut, staring out over the ocean, hoping to see the glint of a paddle. Audrey had just been here, it would be here soon. 
Where was she? Which bay did she traverse now? If we waited long enough, would she appear? Of course, we couldn't wait. The nature of this job meant we moved on nearly every night. And I knew this country was so big, someone could pass by and we would never know it. A whole flotilla could be pushing through the next arm of the bay, shielded from our sight by geography and weather. It wouldn't be a comfortable stay in the hut. The roof was partially covered with what we like to call the Alaska state flag, the ubiquitous blue tarp everyone seemed to use for multiple purposes. In a heavy rain, water would collect on the tarp, blowing it till it shed a waterfall. Wind would whistle right through the arm-sized gaps in the wood. It was not a place built to last. It was more an idea of a shelter than a real one. I can't burn this one down, I told Helga. No way, she agreed. Though it was our job to destroy human-made shelters in the wilderness, this hut seemed to fit here. Things were not always black and white. This hut wouldn't last through many more years of winter storms anyway. We sat for a minute munching on snacks. I lay back, glumly contemplating the plastic bag of nuts and raisins. I was tired of what was left. It didn't matter much. Gradually, everything we ate took on the taste of the sea. Reluctantly, we turned our backs on the elves' hut and returned to our boats. I took one last scan of the island and the bay. I hoped to see a puffy inflatable narrowing the gap between me and the horizon, another woman making her way down the coastline. But there was nobody else, just a black winged sweep of rhinoceros auklets at a distance. Maybe tomorrow, I thought. The currents washed up all sorts of things on the shore, things that only made it to a certain beach by chance. It wasn't so crazy that I could intersect paths with another woman out here who was also writing her own story. She could tell me things, what it was like to swim along a forlorn, forlorn course, coast and how to be a woman out here and how and when to come back to shore. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Mary. I really appreciate it. Your work always takes me there. Uh, everybody, you can learn more about Mary Emmerich at Mary emmerich.com and oh wait i'm hearing from the tech truck some of you may not have heard or been able to see the very first part of mary's reading well rest assured we're recording this and once youtube goes through all its algorithms it will be up on fish traps web page our youtube page and our facebook page so uh, if you missed the very beginning don't worry you'll be able to catch it again maybe in the next couple hours certainly by tomorrow. Speaking of Mary, uh, she taught when all this COVID stuff started happening and we tried to turn an events-based organization into an online kind of experience, Mary raised her hand and volunteered to teach one of our first virtual writing courses last spring. And it just went so well. And I wanna thank Mary for uh, jumping in and doing that. People just really enjoyed it. With that, Fishtrap is going to provide even more of them this season. Starting this fall, we're going to have day-long day workshops, a couple hour-long workshops, month-long online workshops. And the great thing, as we experienced with Mary Emmerich's workshop, is not only people from right here in Northeast Oregon, but people from all over the country were able to uh, enjoy those workshops. So look for an upcoming announcement next week. Um, either in our newsletter or check back at fishtrap.org. And we're working hard on the upcoming winter fish trap program. Now that's, that's part of our, the clear thinking part of our mission. Um, it's coming up this January, it will be virtual and our theme is resilience. Think about that. It means something different for all of us, especially during this time. And we're expanding Winter Fish Trap. It's typically, historically, it's been a weekend in January. Well, it's going to be a month of Saturdays during January covering all sorts of themes of uh, resilience in our lives. So uh, take a look at that. And in February and March, we're gonna do the big read again. I think this is the 15th year or something like that. <laughs> the book we've chosen this year is In the Heart of the Sea, The Tragedy of the Whale Ship Essex by Nathaniel um, Philbrick. Um, it is the true story um, which inspired uh, Melville to write uh, Moby Dick. It's the true story of the whale ship Essex that was rammed by the biggest whale anybody had ever seen in the survival story of the crew. I'm super 
excited about that. And of course, all of us at Fish Trap are working really hard on what summer Fish Trap is going to look like next year. I think you're going to be pleased at the workshops and instructors and subjects that we're going to bring to summer Fish Trap next year. We're all talking about it every day and I can't, we can't wait to roll it out for you um, next month. Okay, let's get to our next reader who has taught at Summer Fish Trap several times and been in a Fish Trap employee and been a part of this organization for a long time. Born in Colorado, Cameron Scott has knocked around the dusty and not so dusty West, holds an MFA in poetry from the University of Arizona and an MAT through Eastern Oregon University. He currently works as a fly fishing guide for Minum Store in the summers and teaches seventh to 12th grade in English at Wallowa School. His lyrical essays and poems have appeared in magazines, journals, and periodicals. And in 2016, he was awarded the Blue Light Book Award for his second book of poetry, The Book of Cold Mountain, which is sitting over here on the shelf right here. He has received residencies over the years through Colorado Art Ranch, Chiloquin Visions in Progress, Playa, Fishtrap, and many others. You can learn more about Cam Scott at writerfish.com, writerfish.com. Uh, Cam, how's fishing and how's the school year going so far? Uh, fishing's pretty good. I had a guided trip today, actually, guiding an old professor uh, at Whitman. Who I didn't know, but one of my best friends uh, grew, who grew up in Walla Walla, um, he was friends with his daughter. So it was pretty cool to guide them today. And the fishing was awesome. Uh, and then school, I haven't gotten COVID yet. So I'm in person and I have <laughs> not gotten COVID. So I'm forever grateful and uh, very grateful to be able to teach face-to-face uh, -face with my kiddos. So well, speaking of face-to-face, -face, I haven't seen you face-to-face -face for a long time. Glad to have you here. And would you read us some stuff? Sure. All right. So uh, just opening tonight, I'm going to read mostly poems. Um, and I'm reading to my dogs, but they're not quite settling down right now. So you might hear scratching or barking as I read. So this is uh, just opening up with two poems of witness. Uh, this is The Man Who Mowed My Lawn for Don Swart. He was my neighbor and a very good man and passed away this spring. There are strange things done in the midday sun by the man who mows my lawn. Where once stood weeds and dandelion seeds, everything above two inches high is gone. How many times have I come home to rows of neatly trimmed grass and accused Don of mowing my lawn only to be given a load of sass? I saw him once when I snuck back for lunch, buzzing around like a man in flight. If he missed a patch or a row didn't match, he'd be back to make things right. When I looked at him and his half-cocked grin, I yelled as loud as I could. I must be blessed to know a man so obsessed with always doing good. The more I've read about the good he spread lets me see what good endows, the quiet kind from the heart and mind and all the good allows. He served as he could for the common good, even in his waning health and showed to me that a man can live free by honoring service above self. There are strange things done in the midday sun by the man who mowed my lawn. I miss him now more than I know how in the ways that we got along. There's only one thing as lost turns to spring that I know how to remedy. So if you see me there mowing your yard with care, it's in his memory. That was to, uh, a little riff off of Robert Service in memory of Don. And the second poem is a poem uh, by Jose Alcantara. And uh, he's just a writer friend of mine who I've known um, in Colorado and came out to Fish Trap. And I believe he was a Fish Trap fellow. Um, and he has a new book coming out uh, very soon, which I'm really excited about. This poem is called While the Dead Pile Up. I like to get up before God takes out her paintbrush and starts dabbing the undersides of clouds, painting them scarlet, copper, gold. It's cold, I'm not alone. The birds are here and skunks and a lost turtle or two. This is the magic time when the sky, like a person changing by the second, might become anything. When what was once gray and lumpy suddenly ignites transforming into a shining lamp 
that, if you could rub it, would grant you endless wishes, though you have only this one, to be here alive witnessing. Um, and I guess this uh, year has been a lot of witnessing different things um, for myself and people that I love. And so these, these poems that I'm about to read in sequence, there's a few of them and they're very short, but they're all poems of witness in some way. Morel hunting. The forest floor is a constellation, my body a starship that travels in search of morels. Led by intuition, this is the purest action I know. Searching tears in the fabric of duff and parting leaves of grass, gathering one after another. Each morel perfect in their imperfections. Brief glimpses where the earth reaches out, calling me to come home. Say anything. What I have builds up as a love song in despair. It builds and builds, then drops as hail. In the morning, shredded petals litter the ground. What birds are left sing laments. I can say anything, and you can say anything, but George Floyd can no longer say anything at all. Fable of Salt. Lover of the long shot, underdog, inexplicable. Curious way this round globe is held in space like a dream and how undreamlike most days are. Evaporated, crystalline, stinging as the body loses and accumulates, accumulates and loses. An ocean of life, an unattainable star. To extract each fish from memory and build a fallible mound is to be buried in history. Accumulation of sweat, accumulation of tears, this single impure conception of self. Bloodless. Silence is not only the spaces between speaking, but the skull bleached by sun, the dead and dying too numerous to mention, the living too numerous to regard, and so each day I regard the dead and try to forget about the living. The riddle is human, to live only answerable to the divine. Huckleberries. Let me believe in sweetness, sparrowing huckleberries with fingertips, burying the branches to bend. I imagine elk bowing toward earth bears stripping away everything that makes a man, that I may lit, lay mid-afternoon, listening to snow melt between boulders, made new from heat and sugar, paws and gills, these watery meanderings. Even the dogs pull from branches equivalent histories, each movement a question of purpose, each berry an answer. I have two more poems here. For Kenosha. There are flowers that rise where they are least expected, have risen before and will rise again. Hold my hands open as others have held their hands for blossoming. As if I hold open long enough, flowers will appear. And then this last one, autumnal for Snake River Basin Steelhead. With that said, we actually have an okay run coming back this fall. So hopefully it continues. Farther on around the bend, farther on where the canyon splits into golden cathedrals, ponderosa, flame and fall light. These are the bodies nearest my body where I'm streamlined as sunlight and water. Where current pulling at my waders is the same current pulling at the line at my fingertips as I stretch through the drift and time becomes scraps of bark strewn on the bottom of an empty wood pile. I would like something to grab hold, but life is running behind or three weeks ahead or already gone. And so I move another few feet downstream and cast again into the light of a pale silver moon caught in long slender pine needles. If desire is evening's fire, 
the smooth bones of driftwood burning yellow, broken boughs popping with pitch. I stand still in the river, looking the direction steelhead will return, the fire ignored. Days, weeks, months, breath rises after dusk, then huffs out in noon shade until one morning, wading boots frozen solid, the ponderosa grow distant and cold as the ghosts of steelhead carve their way home. Thanks, Cam. Those are some beautiful images of this area. Appreciate it. Hey folks, I wanna tell you, if, you want, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about all the folks around here who are creating stuff, um, every uh, fish trap helps facilitate a zine. Do you know what a zine is? A zine is just a little thing like this that's always free. Um, and it usually is on a certain subject. Um, some, some wonderful people here have been creating the Circle of Seasons. It's a, it's a, it's a zine that we uh, help, help put out um, for every season of the year. A new fall one came out. You probably can't get your hands on a, on a version like this, but you can look at it on Fish Trap's website. Um, if you go, you can find the Circle of Seasons webpage at fishtrap.org and download a PDF of it. it. Includes drawings, paintings, poems, stories, recipes, all sorts of different things. So I encourage you to check out the fall issue of Circle of Seasons at fishtrap.org. Um, while Cam was reading, I got an update from the tech truck. And uh, you will be able to see the full, uh, Mary Emmerich's full reading. It may not be tonight or uh, tomorrow, but at some point this weekend, you'll be able to see, see the whole thing. Sorry about the technical glitch. All right, we're coming to our last reader. Um, oh my goodness. Uh, Rich, uh, I seek Rich's counsel um, all the time. He's one of our advisors. And of course, um, has been a part of Fish Trap since before it started. After a five-year stint in the Peace Corps, Rich Wanschneider came to Wallowa County in 1971 as a community, community development agent with the OSU Extension Service. In 1976, he got this great idea to open a bookstore, the Book Loft in Enterprise. <laughs> And in 1988, with help from historian Elvin Josephi and poet Kim Stafford, he founded Fish Trap to promote clear thinking and good writing in and about the West. He served as Fish Trap's executive director until 2008. He has written for the Oregonian, High Country News, Portland Magazine, High Desert Journal, and contributed a regular column to the Wallowa County Chieftain for years and years and years. Um, he's still producing lots and lots of work. I'm on his mail list. It's one of my favorite things. Today he serves as the director of the Josephi, he, today he serves as director of the Josephi Library of Western History and Culture in Joseph. You can learn more about the Josephi Center at josephi.org. Rich, it was good to see you today. How are you doing? I've got on mute. I'm good. <laughs> Am I unmuted? <laughs> Yes. Okay. So Rich and I today were talking a little bit. We 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 met very socially distant, sitting in the green grass at the uh, Enterprise City Park with Angela Bombasi, the executive director of the Homeland Project. And I got to tell you, it was just nice to see people's faces um, in the flesh. It was good. Now it's your turn to read, Rich. Okay. I thought you were going to ask me a question. Um, uh, <laughs> did you have a good all time right. with us? It's all right. What? Did you have a good time with us today? Yes. Yes. I, I thought it was wonderful. What yeah. did you take from our conversation? Oh. Well, it just got a lot of things rolling around in your mind, you know, <laughs> sitting out there on the grass and having three people and leisure and talking about Indians and racism and culture and age and a whole bunch of stuff. It was good. It yeah, was all good. with the background of 
children swinging on swing sets. It was right. I feel like it was right. around this time. All right. We're blessed. That's one of our blessings to be here in this time, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We can be outdoors and do that. Uh -huh. All right. Would you read us a story? I will. Thanks. Okay. Um, I don't need to introduce this. I don't know if I'll make it. I, geez, I used to tell people at Fish Trap, you know, practice, practice, and be sure you've got a timer on. Well, I didn't. I did have a timer one time, and I got, got it through it in 10 minutes. But anyway, here we go. Why I Stayed. A magazine writer from the Smithsonian recently came to the Josephi Center working on a Nez, a Nez Perce story. There are now so many people working on Nez Perce stories that it seems like the people, and especially Hin Matuya Latket, young Chief Joseph, had become metaphors and icons in struggles to understand personal and American history. In his own time, Joseph was the Red Napoleon and the elegant spokesman for a people and for native brothers and sisters across the country. He rode in a carriage with Bill Co Cody at uh, Grant's New York internment. And on his last visit to the, to the Wallawa, was rebuffed by the people of the county as one of a bunch of dirty, lazy, in, lazy Indians in the way of settlement progress. In later times, Joseph has been seen as a war chief and a peace chief. His Nez Perce have been celebrated as and Clark. Homeland. Today, Joseph and General Howard Duell in Daniel Sharfstein's book, thunder in the mountains as their war resolves or doesn't the failures of civil war reconstruction. Daytime Smoke, the real son of a Nez Perce mother and explorer William Clark is portrayed in David Nosborn's novel, The Coming as a man with the foot in both worlds who makes his choice the Indian world and dies in captivity after the war. But I digress, the visiting Smithsonian writer, Tony, has spent the last 30 years traveling and writing the world, Brazil, Cuba, Russia. He asked me how I came to the Wallawa and then why I stayed. I've answered the first question many times and I'll recap in a moment, but the second question stopped me. I can't remember ever just up and facing it. I arrived 50 years ago this summer with a one-year contract and I stayed. I got stuck, I tell people facilely, and they congratulate me on getting stuck in a good place. I came to Willow County in July of 1971 with a one-year contract with OSU's extension service. My job was community development. My office was on the second floor of the courthouse. My boss was an old Wyoming cowboy and livestock agent named Chuck Cavan. I came after five heady years of living in one culture and tasting many others. My tickets to see the world was a Peace Corps. At 22 out of college year, my only foreign travel had been to Baja, California. Now I spent two years in a Turkish village as a Peace Corps volunteer with vacation trips to Syria and Lebanon and traveled home on a raucous six week trip through Europe. While on Peace Corps staff the next three years, I went to conferences in Holland and India, did an evaluation of the Peace Corps program in Iran and helped the German Peace Corps with an evaluation of their program in Tunisia. In between and on the edges from September 67 to July 68, and from September 70 to July 71, I tumultuous periods in our country's history, my perch was Washington, DC. I love Turkey and I love the Peace Corps. In 1966, I thought I wanted my life to be in foreign countries. I took and passed the written foreign service exam in the Ankara embassy. In 1967 at the oral exam in Washington, Chastened by the first Vietnam march and news of the worsening situation there, I finessed a delay so I could take a Peace Corps staff job. In 1970, I came back from Turkey again, this time because Turkey, upset with our war in Vietnam and with a large number of U.S. troops in its country, asked the Peace Corps to leave. In D.C. that second time, with the war in Vietnam descending into chaos and, um, and our government doing the same, I looked for work in rural places. I met an American volunteer in Turkey and we traveled in Europe on the way home and ended up in Washington together. I interviewed in Maine and West Virginia and finished second twice when the Oregon job came along. We called and invited our friends to a wedding and headed west. Judy immediately missed the diversity of her native Pennsylvania, one Polish name in the county, she half joked. But we plowed along with the other young people leaving cities in Vietnam, leaning on each other, forming a food cop 
and a town team basketball league. I love my work and my boss who wouldn't after he and the local ranger took me on a 12 hour, hour tour of the county from Remnaha to the Grand Ron on my first day on the job. A few years into it, we talked some of moving. I was offered extension jobs in Hood River in Ontario, but Judy was doing social work and we had begun the adoption process. In no time, we had a one-year-old in a new bookstore on Main Street in Enterprise with Judy baking bread and cookies to sell from the store. Eventually, she opened Judy's kitchen in the back and we became Rich's Soapbox and Judy's Soap Opera as friends, including a retired Chuck Gavin, came in to talk and keep us afloat. We adopted another boy, six years old by estimation, from Calcutta, bringing our cross-cultural experience home, we joke. We had not thought much about race and diversity, although we knew the county was white, and we were beginning to get the story of the Nez Perce who had been chased out. Friends rallied around us, and the new boy, as he learned English and learned to ride a bike and ski his first December. We were members of the voluntary poor, but we had our own stores, Ski Hill, two challenging but enjoyable kids and good friends. I even got on the school board despite a write-in campaign against me saying I was a wild-eyed leftist who would bring rap, rack and abortion to the school. Once after a statewide vote banning mandatory notification of parents of students' claims of sexual abuse passed in our county, community members came to the school board with right to life literature and a film. I told them that they could put their literature out as far as I was concerned, as long as they also posted information on help and abortion availability. That argument went no further. Part of what was gluing me to this place was the notion that I could make a difference. I wasn't just having fun and enjoying the beauty of mountains and canyons. I was selling people books, which informed coaching soccer and baseball, hopefully passing on some positive attitudes to my sons and others. I got into the school through dis dismissal of an errant teacher and helped form an arts council. Soon we had an arts curriculum, the best in the state we thought, from grades K to 12 in enterprise. We grew that arts council over coffee in Judy's kitchen and soon added a, soon added a co-op gal art gallery to show off work of four local artists. And all the while the Nesper story grew stronger. Alvin Giuseppe came from the East in early summer each year, asking about new history books, telling of a conference in Sun Valley and a new museum of the American Indian in Washington. New books and articles tumbled out of him in the 1980s and the Nez Perce National Historical Park, which he'd lobbied for years ago, added sites in Washington, Montana and Wallowa County to its original Idaho base in 1992. In 1988, I, along with Alvin and Kim Stafford, who I had met in the bookstore when he was a poet in the residence in Wallawa, launched Fish Trap, a nonprofit promoting writers and writing in the West. I directed Fish Trap for 20 years, hosting scores of published writers and hundreds of student writers. Kim, Alvin, and many others became close friends and colleagues as we explored the history, cultures, and literature of the West. I also learned more of the Nez Perce inviting them to teach, read, and tell stories at our gatherings. At about the same time as we launched Fish Trap, another group started hosting powwows in the town of Wallow and grew another nonprofit, the Wallow Nespers Homeland. The Nespers who had been removed in 1877, but now there were many of us who wanted them to come home. I've talked your ear off, Tony, and not said all that much about the Nespers. I haven't even told you the story of Alvin Josephi's books in establishing the library which is, which is how you came to meet me. There were many other steps along the road and places I could have stepped off, but I didn't. I think the Nez Perce is a primary reason why. The other reason might be kids, the ones we adopted and two more, children of our boy from India, I raised. As he grew into an adolescence, the cute little brown boy became a threat to some. He got the N-word, had a couple of overtly racist teachers and didn't graduate at high school then went off to Portland and soon was having babies, which overwhelmed him. A seven-year-old boy and a nine-year-old girl came to me and I became their primary parent. Judy and I had parted in an amicable divorce by that time. The movie played again, cute, no beautiful brown children until adolescence. The idea that love and goodwill, our town and that of many friends, could guide them through taunts and prejudices passed down from parents to children in a place where they had no peers of color 
turned out to be flat out wrong. The girl, beautiful and natural horsewoman, went in fits and starts to all three county schools and had ended up graduating online. The boy, a gifted athlete who excelled in football, got the N-word and other slurs from opposing players and coaches and remarks too from his own teammates. They thought, as one teacher said, that they were being funny. My kids and grandkids are all gone from here now, but I'm here and the Nez Perce are here. Once distressed with the crap my grandson was getting, I spilled the story to a Nez Perce friend. Don't tell me about it, he said. I've been brown for 80 years. But that friend comes back here to build a homeland for his grandchildren. I stay here because of him and other Nez Perce people and Nez Perce stories I know. I stay because I want to carry on Alvin Josefi's work, listening to Indians and telling me, my white friends and the wider public that Indians are still here and they have things to teach us. I could guess I could travel like Tony or like Alvin did, did when he wrote 500 Nations and chaired the board of the, of the National Museum of the American Indian. But this place and the Nesper story are good enough for me. All of the drama and heartache, broken treaties and broken lives that my country has visited on Indians harassed and expected to vanish into the American melting pot ever since 1492 are here in the Nez Perce story. Stories of military valor, of wisdom and wise living, of charity to others, and most of all, of resilience in the face of everything. It's all right here, surrounding me in the rivers and mountains of Hinmatuyalak Ketsoma. Tony, I'll help you and others share pieces of that story and do some myself. And I'll dream a day when the white place is brown again with Nez Perce descendants and my own grandchildren and great-grandchildren dancing and singing together at Tampkalix, the, the homeland powwow near the forks of the river where old Joseph, young Joseph's father, Tuikakas, was first laid to rest. Thank you. How long was I, Mike? I, don't, I wasn't counting. I was just enjoying it, Rich. That was real nice. <laughs> I had never heard Rich's soapbox and Judy's soap opera before. That's that's a new one for me. I like that. And thank you for telling that, continuing to tell that story. It's it's such a good one. And it shows just how everybody here has a different story. And um, we hope that Fish Trap is a place where people can feel comfortable and safe to be able to tell those stories. I do want to thank uh, Mary Emmerich Cam, Scott, and Rich for uh, going along on this ride with us. Fish, Fish Trap Fireside is such a dear program to all of us. And uh, uh, even though we have to do it in square bo in little boxes, um, it's still good to see all of you and to see all the people who tuned in to listen to it. Um, again, we will uh, have it recorded and provide it soon. Um, I do want to thank again Copper Creek Mercantile for hosting and supporting this month's uh, Fish Trap Fireside. Um, if you had a good time tonight, if this was worth your time, and I hope it was, um, I encourage you to feed the fish. That's Fish Trap's way of saying um, if you could make a donation or help support the programs that we have, you can go to fishtrap.org or any place on our website and find out a way to give a little bit to help these programs going. The next Fish Trap Fireside is Friday, November 6th. Circle that on your calendar. You'll hear work from long time Fish Trap friend. And from what I heard when he was a kid, he hung out at the book loft with Rich a lot, Benjamin Curry, and uh, some new work from somebody we're so excited about here, uh, Maul McCarty and more. Um, uh, learn all about Fish Traps programs at fishtrap.org. Thanks to all my coworkers for supporting me in uh, hosting this and the whole Fish Trap community. Um, I started out the program by saying this, and I'm going to end it to um, How are you doing out there? Hold on. We'll get through this. I hope to see you again next month. Good night. <laughs>